Amen. Awesome. You can take your seat tonight. Can we say a big thank you to our worship team? Amazing job, guys, tonight. Ryan, I'm going to hand you this. And also, can we also say a massive thank you? You know, the worship team stand up here, but the truth is they're kind of playing um, almost in invisibility. It's the guys in that box back there that make it sound so incredible. And tonight I noticed Emily, Trevor, and Leo, all volunteers, everybody, serving in the house of God. Can we put our hands together for all our volunteers? Amazing, guys. Well, my name's Zach, if we haven't met, and uh, I'm our creative pastor here at church, and it's a great pleasure just to share with you for a little bit from the Word of God, and I want to extend a welcome to you, welcome if you're in the room with us, but a special welcome to everyone who's watching online right now on Facebook, we're so great to have you with us tonight, and uh, also a a welcome to everyone who's listening on podcast. I listen to the podcast while I run, so maybe you're listening right now and you're running, keep going, you're doing great, you can make your PB. Maybe. And a big hello to everyone watching on Review TV, nice and early on Sunday morning. Great to have you with us too. Now, to start our conversation, I want to talk to you a little bit about home renovations. Anyone a home renovator in the room? Show of hands. Oh, tough crowd tonight. All right, we're going to have to work hard with this. So I love home renovations. It's like become a hobby of mine. And I think in my 10 years being a pastor now, I've realized that people aren't projects. So I kind of need other things to do. Uh, My wife was kind of my test case to try and, you know, make her better um, as a project, but it didn't really work out. And praise God, I've moved on to home renovations. And, uh, you know, so it's a a great hobby of mine. It's something I really love doing. Um, I love ticking something off the list and getting something done around the house. And, you know, I think I got this from my grandparents. So when I was growing up, my grandparents were pastors of a church for many years, and uh, their side hustle was to buy, renovate, and sell property for a profit. And I remember one time we went to McDonald's, and they filled us up with a big breakfast, as every kid loves, and then they took us straight to the renovation property, and we smashed out a kitchen and a bathroom for them, you know, free labor. Um, It was fantastic, though, and I think it's developed a bit of a love for it later in life for me. So I love home renovations. Um, You know, Claire and I have these dreams for our house. We want to knock out our back room and build a big extension. But, you know, that's a big project, and you've got to start small when you're starting with projects. And so I've been doing a few projects around the house, and I wonder, do you want to see some of them? Yeah, Yeah, okay. All right, well, the first one I've been working on is a picket fence. And uh, so this is a before photo of what it used to look like at the front. It's kind of mid uh, preparation, but I wanted to protect the kids from the traffic and the dog, um, and now this is what it looks like, finished. Oh, come on, somebody. Thank you very much. No tradesmen, just me. This is good for my confidence. Um, second one is that I've been working on a fireplace, so restoring a fireplace in my home. So here's what it looked like before. Um, you know, a bit grotty, lots of soot. And uh, I've, this is what now it looks like, after. Oh, I hear the audible, whoa. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm a budding um, renovator, and I really enjoy it. But it's not just renovating. Like, I love home reno shows. Anyone a fan of the block? Show of hands. You know, here's my thing with the block. It's not really renovation. It's more about drama than it is about reno. So, you know, some other home reno shows, uh, you know, we're talking about Bible characters, but I wish we could just talk all night about Chip and Joanna Gaines, everyone. Any fixer-upper fans? Oh, I heard a clap up the back. That's awesome. Hey, can we get some light on the guys at the back? That'd be great. I'm struggling to see you. What about flip or flop? Anyone a flip or flop fan? No, bit of a flop. Uh, and what about Masters of Flip? Anyone like these guys? Dave and Courtney from Masters of Flip. I love this show. And you know, Courtney has this crazy talent. She matches her outfits to the color scheme of the finished renovation. That's just like talent right there. So, you know, watching home renovation shows um, just pump me up, man. Get me excited to do the next home renovation at our little house. But while I love home renos, one of my most hated job is the silicone, the gap filler. This stuff right here. Uh, So you have the gap filler, and then you have like a little gun. And what happens is the gun squeezes out this putty stuff that fills the gap between two surfaces. So you've got an unfinished product, and then this stuff fills it. But 
I hate it, man. I, like, I love putting together the bones of a build, but the gap filler, I don't like. And there's three reasons, what, re- three reasons rather why I don't like it. Firstly, um, it's super messy. So as soon as you start squeezing that stuff, it comes out everywhere, goes all over your hands. Um, it's risky as well. You know, as soon as, again, you start squeezing, anything could happen. You could get it everywhere, all over your carpet. But it also kind of hurts, you know, I'm like bending down, I have bad knees, and I'm like contorting my body into weird places and shapes to try and fill these gaps. But as I was recently renovating the fireplace, it dawned on me that this concept of the gap and filling the gap doesn't just exist in physical space, but it actually also exists in our cultural sphere and in our spiritual world as well. This idea in each of our lives that there is a gap A gap between reality and possibility. A gap between what is and what should be. You know, and as followers of Jesus, we often find ourselves standing right in the middle of that gap. Anyone feel me? Anyone relate to that? You know, but if I'm honest, I often resist the urge to stand in the gap because it's hard, it hurts, it's messy, and it's risky. You know, it's hard to stand in the gap in our families to say, hey, let's not talk about that family member that way when they're not here. Let's not gossip about them. It's hard to stand in the gap in our friendships, you know, to say, hey, I know that's your kind of cool and your kind of fun, but that's that's not what I'm about. I'm going to sit this one out. It's hard to stand in the gap in our workplaces. Hey, I know everyone's doing it, but I don't live by that code. That's not what I'm about. It's hard to stand in the gap. What about injustice? To say, hey, it's wrong to treat people who are seeking refuge in our country this way. Let's find a better way together. It's hard to hold the tension between reality and possibility. It's messy, it hurts, it's risky. But I think God loves gap fillers. You know, I think He loves gap fillers because in the gap lies so much potential. See, take my fireplace, right? Like, when it's put together, the basic structure is nice, but its full potential hasn't been realized. It's only when the silicone enters the gap is the basic structure made complete. In other words, the gap filler transforms that thing from something basic into something beautiful. You know, God loves gap fillers. And our Bible character today is like the OG, the original gap filler for God. His name is Elijah, or as I like to call him, Elijah, no more gaps. (laughs) So who was Elijah? Well, Elijah was a prophet um, to Israel from a foreign community called Tishbe. Everybody say Tishbe. Now, it's important to note that according to the scriptures, prophets aren't fortune tellers. They aren't uh, special people with magical powers or dream catchers. They're normal, ordinary people like you and like me that stand in the gap, that speak on behalf of God, calling out idolatry, injustice, and calling God's people back to full commitment to Him. So prophets were called to stand in the gap between human brokenness and God's best for our lives, to be gap fillers. So before we keep talking about Elijah, I want to explain a little bit of the gap that existed in Israel's history. It's important to understand what gap Elijah, God was asking him to fill before we talk about Elijah himself. So you with me? All right. So the, Elijah's story is found in the book of Kings. Everybody say Kings. So Kings is a story about how Israel's kings, hence the name Kings, 40 or so kings it tells the story of how they continually fall short of God's best and God's expectations. And Kings tells the story of the consequences of that. I mean, it's crazy stuff in the book of Kings. It kind of makes Game of Thrones look like Baby Shark. It's wild. And um, the story in Kings starts well. So Solomon, who inherits the kingdom from his father, King David, he builds the temple. And this is a place where heaven and earth meet. How heaven and earth collide and God dwells with his people. But in the pursuit of more political power, uh, Solomon decides to marry a bunch of women from all the surrounding nations. And with those women, they, when they come to Israel, they bring with them their rituals, their practices, and their gods. 
And essentially, this leads to Solomon's downfall, instituting idolatry across the nation of Israel. And the, and the writer of Kings says that Solomon, at the end of his life, looked more like the Pharaoh that they ran away from than that of his father, King David. Isn't that sad? So following Solomon is a tale of 40-something kids, kings, sorry, not kids, And it's a tale of greed, a tale of lust for power, and there's a split that occurs between Israel in a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Sounds a little bit like Perth, right? North and south, we battle it out. But the worst of all of the kings was a man called King Ahab, who is Elijah's arch nemesis. Listen to what it says about King Ahab in the scriptures. It says, Ahab did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. Wow, what an MO, what a thing to put on your CV, that you're the worst. (laughs) So the gap between human brokenness and God's best was absolutely huge. I mean, Ahab and Jezebel were cruel, terrible leaders. Um, They weren't faithful to the covenant. They worshiped all these other gods and instituted idolatry across the whole nation. They essentially broke every single rule that God gave them. Israel wasn't in a good spot, and clearly a gap filler was needed. So God raised up the best he had in Elijah. So the question for us, if that's the gap and Elijah stands in the gap, what is it that we can learn from Elijah's life as we seek to be a prophetic people who stand in the gap between reality and possibility, amen? The first lesson from Elijah's life relates to the issue of identity, So introducing Elijah, the Bible writes this. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. I mean, this is the first moment Elijah is introduced. Every other prophet in scripture is introduced with, and thus says the word of the Lord, giving them an introduction essentially validating them, but Elijah just bursts on the scene like a bull in a china shop, you know, holding no punches back, just calling out Ahab on his rebellion and his corruption, declaring that the consequences of this would be a drought, no water across the whole nation. This tells us a few things, but predominantly that Elijah was a bold person. He was a pretty confident guy just to burst into the king and say this thing. But I don't think it's a human confidence or an arrogance. It's a deep faith with an understanding and stirred by an understanding and a deep conviction of who he is in God. And this is our first lesson from the life of Elijah, that my identity in him means his authority in me. Amen? My identity in him means his authority in me. So Elijah's name literally means my God is Jehovah. His name points to where his identity lies. You know, people in Israel would have known who Elijah was, what he was about by his name and who his name represented, who he belonged to. So my parents live in South Perth and it's a beautiful place to live. It's really close to the foreshore. You can go on bike rides and rollerblading, whatever you want to do. South Perth's wonderful, Um, and every year there's a particular show in South Perth called the Fireworks. Anyone go down to the Fireworks every year? And if you know and if you've been, they lock down the whole area of South Perth, like you can't get in. Um, So people park all over the place, all in Vic Park and walk kilometers down, but not me. Because of my identity and my belonging to the Gagler family, I have full access, people. I just flash my little driver's license that says who I am, and they let me straight through into the restricted area. And because of who I am, but more importantly, who I belong to. You know, you belong in the family of God. We sung about it tonight. You belong in the family of God, and your position in His family is permission to stand for Him. Paul says this in Galatians 4. He says, because we are his children, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father, now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Isn't that great news tonight? To recognize the authority that is given to you in Christ Jesus. My identity in him means his authority in me. Can you say amen? 
So it's important to note that Elijah's identity and his sense of self didn't come from their authority, but from God's. See, Elijah wasn't an Israelite. He clearly did not fit the mold of what would constitute authority within Israel. Um, and King Ahab, you know, kind of gets a bit frustrated by this and flips his, little bit, uh, his lid a little bit. Listen to this in 1 Kings 18. He says, when Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, so it is really you, you troublemaker of Israel? I've made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers. Shots fired. But can you imagine if someone came up to me after tonight's service and said, hey, Zach, you troublemaker of Riverview? You know, one, that'd be a bit weird because I'm not a troublemaker. I'm a nice guy. But if they did, you know what? To be honest with you, I'd probably be a little taken back. And those words might stick a little bit. They might shape a bit of what I think about myself. But Elijah's strong reply shows that his identity was not shaped nor affected by what people thought about him or what they said about him. And church, I want to encourage you, don't let your identity to be shaped by what they say about you. Allow it to be shaped alone by what he says about you. Here's a few things he says. He says, you are greatly loved by God, that you are God's workmanship created in Christ to do good works, that you are an ambassador for Christ, that you are a chosen generation, a holy nation, that you are born of God and the evil one will not touch you, that you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Come on, can you give God thanks tonight that you are found in Christ Jesus? So Elijah's ability to stand in the gap is because he understood that my identity in him means his authority in me. So we know that Elijah uh, was a foreigner. He was from Tishbe on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Um, and commentators helpfully tell us a few things about these people and how they were different from the Israelites. So they say that um, the people from this area were normally hard-nosed, rugged, tanned, leathery, and particularly hairy. Yeah, a little bit like Dan Byrne over there, uh, lead guitarist, he's super hairy. And leathery. <laughs> um, so people from this area weren't polished, um, they weren't cultured, they weren't uh, diplomatic at all. In other words, they would stand out like a sore thumb, like you'd really notice them. Probably a little bit like a Dockers fan at an Eagles home game. I mean, they're wearing the complete opposite colors of the team. Everyone would be like, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. You're not a part of our team. So people in Israel would have noticed Elijah, and they would have felt like he was a little bit weird. A little bit weird. He doesn't look like us. He doesn't talk like us. He doesn't act like us. He doesn't walk like us. He doesn't work like us. I wonder, have you ever felt like people thought you were a bit weird? Anybody? Yep. Definitely my brother, Ryan. <laughs> this morning, you know, I was preparing for this message, and I went to my local cafe, and uh, I'm sitting there with my iPad, and I'm just kind of preparing, kind of muttering to myself under my breath, and I definitely got so many, he's weird looks, <laughs> you know. Um, the truth is, if you're in the room, and you believe in the invisible God, and you believe in a virgin birth, newsflash, you're a little weird. You're a little weird to the rest of our nation. So turn to the person next to you and say, you're weirder than me. And turn to the person on the other side and say, I'm not even going to get started. <laughs> Don't worry, you, me, Elijah, we're all in this together. So after three years of drought, God says to Elijah, hey, it's time to go to King Ahab and challenge these false prophets to prove that I alone am God. So we pick up the story in verse 20. It says, Ahab summoned all the people to Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? Next slide. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people were completely silent. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Can you imagine that? One person against 450 enemies. That would feel a little weird. You know, you may know the rest of the story. What happens is the false prophets, the false god Baal, attempt everything to call down fire. They even start cutting themselves, says the scriptures, to try and will this false god into bringing down fire, but nothing happens. Elijah just sits there, laughs, and mocks them. 
literally laughing out loud. And then he moves forward and he prays and asks God to prove himself as God. And God rains down fire from heaven and absolutely consumes all of the wet wood, but also all of the water around, comprehensively proving that he alone is God. And what a great reminder that we serve and we are identified in a mighty and a powerful God. Amen. But I find it interesting that God didn't raise up a mighty army against Ahab. I mean, he could have. God didn't send his angels to deal with the rebellion of Israel. He could have. He didn't raise up another human king to usurp the throne. Instead, he sent a weird lone ranger, a foreign prophet. And this is the second lesson from Elijah's life for us, that my weird can be God's weapon that my weird can be God's weapon. What others think is weird about me could be the very thing that God uses as a weapon for his purposes. Let me tell you a little bit about my friend Brandon. So Brandon uh, works on our staff team here at Review. He's an amazing young guy. But when Brandon was six years old, he was diagnosed with ADHD. And um, his life changed dramatically from this point. As soon as he was diagnosed, he was immediately put on medication and spent a large proportion of his time as a young boy in doctor's offices. Not exactly what all the other kids were doing at the time. You know, his brain moves at a rapid pace, essentially a hyperactive state. And that meant that Brandon was unable to sit still in school, retain focus, let alone remember anything that was being said or shared. He hated it, man. And uh, he saw it as a real weakness in his life. But what I love about Brandon's story is that between the ages of 16 and 24, God began to redeem and renew his perspective on ADHD. What Brandon experienced was somewhat of a breakthrough at 24 years of age on how the boundless energy, the hyperactive state, and the hyper-awareness of self that comes with ADHD might not be a curse to his life, but it could be, in fact, a blessing. And now Brandon functions as one of the most uh, amazing young entrepreneurs I've ever seen in my life. You know, Brandon told me this week that at some point in his journey, he had to decide to claim full ownership of who God made him to be. And by doing so, by claiming ownership of who God made him, was, was the key to him shifting his perspective on something that he saw as a weakness or something that he thought was weird to become a weapon for good in his life. And you know, I wonder, I wonder if too many of us see our weird as a weakness in how we serve God. You know, my relationship status, God can't use me. My family of origin, man, there's just too much baggage, there's too much hurt, God can't use me. My level of education or lack thereof, God can't use me. My financial situation, how much money or success I've had, God definitely can't use me. But what if we didn't disqualify ourselves? What if we could see that my weird could be God's weapon? What if like Elijah, we could declare, God, if you place me against these 450 enemies, if you place me in this situation, if you put me in this environment, if you put me in this school, if you put me in this university, if you put me in this workplace, if you put me, God, in this church, you must want me here. Maybe God wants you here. It's time to reclaim your weird and see it as a weapon for God. Instead of asking for an escape from your situation, maybe it's time to renew your perspective. So what's your weird? Embrace it. What's your weird? Where has God placed you? What is he asking of you? You know, the truth is standing in the gap comes with pressure. Like being seen as weird just because you're obedient to God Losing friendships because you stand up for what you believe in. All these things come with an emotional toll. And uh, Elijah experiences this quite immensely. So after the miracle of fire at Mount Carmel, um, a few things happen. Firstly, Ahab rushes home to tell Jezebel about what happened. And uh, he says to her, like, Elijah proved that God is God, but he also killed all of the 450 prophets of Baal. Side note. And this makes her super angry, like really angry. And she sends a message specifically to Elijah, saying, Elijah, I'm gonna make it my life's mission to kill you. 
whoa. Elijah just crumbles at this point. I mean, he doesn't know what to do. He turns to God. Listen to this in 1 Kings 19. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and there he left his servant. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. I mean, this is like a complete U-turn from the Elijah, this strong, bold Elijah, this confident Elijah that stood at the prophets of Baal mocking them. (laughs) Right here we see Elijah broken. And this tells me a few things. Firstly, that Elijah is a normal human. (laughs) That Elijah isn't just this no more gaps prophet, but he experiences the pain and the mess and the hurt of standing in the gap. And he's someone that we can relate to and learn from because he's like us. But secondly, it tells me that when it comes to standing in the gap, pressure is par for the course. Pressure is a part of our life. We know that. Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble. So it's not whether we'll experience pressure. The question we must ask is how do we release pressure in our lives? Well, let's listen to what happens in Elijah's story in verse 5. It says, he there, there, then, whoo, then he laid down and slept under a broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. Delicious. <laughs> so he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came and touched him and said, get up, eat some more. Or the journey will be too much for you. He got up, ate, drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And there he came to a cave where he spent the night. So this is the third lesson from the life of Elijah, that his presence releases my pressure. His presence releases my pressure. So Elijah's pressure is released through physical and spiritual nourishment in the presence of God. In other words, Elijah's ability or authority to lead is linked to his ability to feed. His authority to lead is linked to his ability to feed and nourish himself. So there's two places he does this. Firstly, at the broom tree. And uh, this represents the place of rest. And this is where God asks Elijah, just get up, eat some bread and some water that I've prepared for you, and sleep again, rest. You know, I love through this passage that it tells us that God is interested in our physical state. God is interested in our physical state. You know, it's not rocket science. If you're feeling the pressure, it might be time to get a good night's sleep. If you're feeling the pressure, it might be time to stop throwing shade at everyone else and sit under the shade. Oh. Release the valve of pressure in your life by getting a great sleep, eating, exercising, and getting some rest. That's God's best for our life. And it's important that we do that. Secondly, God meets with Elijah at Mount Sinai, and this represents the place of restoration where God meets and dwells and encounters Elijah. You know, this tells us that worship, prayer, and time in the presence of God in the Word doesn't just bring survival to our lives, but it brings vitality to our soul. Worship, prayer, and time in the presence of God is like a decompression chamber for our souls, So where is God trying to release pressure in your life? It might be time to get into His presence. His presence releases my pressure. You know, one of the realities that Elijah faced in this moment wasn't just pressure, but the absolute exhaustion that came as a result of that pressure. Verse 9 says this, The Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you torn down your altar, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. So Elijah, in this moment, comes to God and says, God, I've done all of these things that you've asked me to do. I've done all of this for you. I've been zealous and passionate about your call. But it's amounted to nothing. You know, Elijah's emphasis right here on what he's done for God reveals to us that he's experiencing something called burnout. He's in a place of burnout. Have you ever experienced burnout before? 
Maybe you're lacking the energy and the motivation to stand in the gap because you're burnt out, you're tired, you're weary. You know, I love that God doesn't criticize Elijah, but he encourages him by his spirit. He shows him something pretty important. Listen to this in verse 11. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. Pretty powerful experience where God shows his might and his power, but also his tenderness. And in this moment, God is reminding Elijah of a vital truth. And this is our final lesson from Elijah's life, this, that who I stand before empowers me to stand for. That who I stand before, the God of all creation, empowers me to stand for the God of all creation. This lesson is that the gift of life comes from the giver of life that the provision of bread and water come from the provider of all things. This tells us that all of creation, people and things are held together by who? The creator. That who I stand before empowers me to stand for. See, God is saying this to Elijah. He's saying, Elijah, stop doing this in your own strength. The thing that you feel like you're carrying is the thing that is actually carrying you. The thing you feel like you're carrying is the thing that is carrying you. Let me explain it like this. So, you know, this silicon, it's stuck in a tube, and it can't really get out by itself. It can't really do anything on its own. It's only when the silicon is put in the what? The gun that enables it and empowers it to make a difference, to fill the gap. And hear what God's saying to us is that you can't do it on your own. You need to be held within the arms and the hands of the creator. That only in the maker, in the designer's hands, are you empowered to do what he's asked you to do. So position yourself before the king of kings, the Lord of lords, amen. Because that's where the power actually lies. Only when you're squeezed in the hands of the creator can you do anything Paul reminds us of this in 1 Corinthians, writing this, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been the one making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. It's His power at work in us. So who I stand before empowers me to stand for. Can you say amen tonight? You know, sadly, Elijah's life uh, actually ends and he's ultimately unsuccessful in turning Israel around from idolatry and injustice. After Elijah's life, Ahab and Jezebel's reign, there were numerous battles and coups for power, mass killings that resulted in complete destruction and exile from the land that God had given them. A really sad story. But the biggest lesson to learn in this tragedy as we seek to be gap fillers for God is this, that God doesn't call us to bring about, to bring to pass His whole purpose. God calls us to play our part in His purpose. So God doesn't call us to successful outcomes. He calls us to obedience. I mean, Jesus Himself said, those who love me will obey my commands. Elijah, you know, he was faithful. He was obedient to what God had asked of him. And he ultimately understood, I think, that God would bring his full purpose to pass. And he just played his part in it. Listen to what Elijah prays at the miracle of fire at Mount Carmel. He says this, At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, of Isaac and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. That these people will know, O Lord, that you are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. You know, only God can turn hearts back to Him. Only God truly can build His church. 
Only God can restore and renew all of creation. Only God can bring His full purpose to pass. But praise God, He calls us to play our part in His purpose. He calls us to be obedient, to be faithful, to play our part in His purpose. And Elijah's story gives us the keys in how we play our part. Firstly, we embrace our identity. Second, we redeem our weird. Thirdly, we reside in His presence, releasing our pressure. And lastly, we rely wholly on His power. So let's play our part in God's purpose. Come on, let's embrace the call to stand in the gap, to be a prophetic people that hold that tension between reality and possibility. Can you say amen tonight? Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet?